So yeah, the Middle Ages sucked balls, at least in Europe. Everyone stank, people were dying of flu, and your place in society was fixed forever. If you were born as a pawn and you had a new, ingenious and revolutionary idea, well, bad luck, because you will have to be a pawn your whole life. They called it the Cosmic Force. Shakespeare wrote that all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players, because that's how people used to live. If you were born to, I don't know, raise pigs, you could just do that, play your role, take some good care of those pigs and wait for the sweet relief of death to go to heaven. The people at the time thought that was how the world worked and nothing could change, until everything changed. First the Black Death killed almost half of Europe's population. Soon the labor force became a lot more valuable and with pockets full of gold, the European pawns started to wonder, what kind of god would allow something like this? At the time the Turks saw Constantinople and said, yoinks! All the sages and scholars exiled from the last Roman city fled to Italy, carrying their ancient libraries. There they discovered that coffee was becoming popular in the European streets where people used to drink more beer than water, so little by little the streets emptied of stumbling drunks and filled with very awake people, discussing ideas and looking for somewhere to take a goddamn piss. All of this, and also the taking of Granada, the birth of reductionist thinking and St. Thomas Aquinas ideas, it was a multifactorial thing. All of this led many Europeans to abandon the medieval thinking and discover the ideas that began the first renaissance. First we lost our place in the universe. Earth was no longer the center of a crystal dome where stars were floating. We discovered that it was a small body rotating around the sun through the vastness of the universe. We also lost our place in society. The dumbest nobles and the smartest plebeians learned that everyone could decide which life to live. The most curious even took this idea further and decided that just animals follow the natural laws. Mankind, through reason and technique, the eye and the hand, can transform itself and the world around it. The soul became subject instead of substance. Before it was seen as some sort of radio signal floating in space until a human body received it. Now we believe it's like a song playing in an iPod and if the music player is destroyed then that specific song stops playing. There was born the individual, as we know it. Magic became science. Centuries of empiric observations and deductions about the animas, humors and sensations that move the world were seen through the lens of the scientific method. In the end we were left with only that which could be described through mathematics or replicated in experiments. The ideals of the Renaissance were simple. Progress, human emancipation, freedom, domination of nature and rationality. Today they seem obvious, but back then they were so revolutionary that they transformed humanity from this to this in a very short time. Today looks like a really long process lasting centuries, but look at the thousands and thousands of years that humanity spent on its more primitive state, and look at the millions of years that we spend on earth doing nothing more than hunt animals and walk around being prey. After millennia of stagnation we developed new languages to speak with reality and new devices to observe it. The discoveries of one generation became the inventions of the next one, and at the end of the 19th century we had the fastest transportation that humanity had ever seen, the most efficient production in history and almost instantaneous communications around the planet. The future seems so bright while Jules Verne described the technological wonders of tomorrow. What perfect society was going to emerge from all this abundance and wisdom? What miracles were waiting for us in the 20th century? Well, in 1914 we began the most terrible war humanity had ever seen. All of Europe's science and engineering were used to destroy the civilization that shaped them. And by 1918, when peace was signed, 37 million people had died. But okay, war was over, and this new experiment called capitalism failed catastrophically, it wouldn't be the last time, and threw the whole world into a great depression. Economic problems led to social problems, and if anyone still had a little bit of hope for the future, another world war started in 1939. The brilliant progress of history died between Auschwitz and the Gulag. But then came the socialist revolutions to free all of world's workers from greed and injustice, to build a proletariat utopia fair for everyone and in the end it just became a bunch of totalitarian and repressive states. And the worst part is they killed the hopes for change and gave a very powerful tool for the devil's advocates and the ideologues of the status quo. Hey guys. 
capitalism. Let's say, okay, let's say that you oppose capitalism. Let's say hypothetically that you're a communist, right? Then hypothetically, you'd be for equal redistributing poverty. Now we've established that not only are you a Stalinist, but you're also a genocide advocate. Then I believe that you'd agree with me when I say that capitalism is freedom and communism is tyranny. Hey, playboy, get back to work. Ah, uh, yes, yes, boss. Ah, uh, the 20th century. When you really look at it, it really was a very irrational time. Well, it gave us the internet, but ah, forget it. The technological wonders of Jules Verne disappeared, science fiction became pessimistic, the threat of nuclear annihilation led us to abandon any hopes of progress, and the Renaissance values of truth and beauty were abandoned for the only things left, the individual and the capital. Today we have to deal with the consequences of this filthy, violent and dishonest century. Because look, the progress of science discovered this magical material that can be transformed into anything and is cheap and now we have a plastic island the size of Texas in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But look, we invented a new fuel that made all processes more efficient and uh, it also causes greenhouse gases that warm the atmosphere, melt the poles, alter the entire world's climate and in 20 years Florida will be underwater. But look, the economic models paved the way for a golden age of commerce and dude, they gave your job to a Taiwanese boy? No wonder the owner of my company is one of the eight individuals who possesses as much wealth as 50% of the world's poorest population. Excuse my French, but modernity is wumps. Yes, I said it, wumps. The ideal of modernity have been turned upside down because let's look at the living things. For modernity, this is no longer a tree, with value in itself. Now it's raw material a resource that we can use for our purposes, wood for our important projects or paper to print our glorious culture. If it's lucky, we can use it as decoration in a park, but the life of the tree is never the end in itself. The ultimate goal in modernity is the function that something can fulfill for the human being. I mean, just look at it, my little monkey. So beautiful, so gorgeous, so majestic. Doesn't he deserve it all? So far so good, I mean kinda, but then we look to the other side to ourselves. Through this individualism jaded by four centuries and two world wars, we started to see other human beings as raw materials, without value in themselves, cannon fodder, labor force, political capital. In every big shot office there is a human resources department and no one thinks it's denigrating. This cool faced demagogue just went in live television to call his fellow human beings human capital and half the country cheered for him and the other half just took it. Never was the human life worth so little, and the individual so much. But even with all your individual liberties, you, the individual, were left alone against the human mass, against the indifference of an abstract system that controls everything and for which you're just a faceless statistical blip, a single vote against millions, a figure in a census, zeros and ones in a Facebook database. You learn about everything, but you can do nothing about it. You have an opinion on all public matters, but you don't decide in any of them. Every day you have less and less control of the systems around you, so you limit yourself to vote in elections that you don't trust in and to play your role as a carefree consumer. Ah, and by the way, don't forget to smile. Remember that you are the sole responsible of your own happiness in this meritocratic paradise. And isn't this scene very similar to the great cosmic farce we started with? Ah, well, at least we have more costumes now. Oh, modernity, how can we fix it? Well, we could bring back the values of the past, return to tradition, to religious beliefs, adhere ourselves to the cultural heritage against the corrosions of reason, to collective conventions against critical attitudes. Well, that is already being done in some countries and ugh, this one is too close, damn it. And the results are not very encouraging, to say the least. In the third world, the nostalgia is stopping the change that we really need, and in the United States it is promoting a return to barbarism, a new age of darkness and confusion. Do you think the world is in bad shape? Well, brace yourself, because it can always get so much worse. Oh, you'd be surprised. We also have the skeptic realism. We can do as Fukuyama and say, enough, game's over, history's over, let's all go home. We thought art and history and science had a purpose, but all of that were just meta-narratives, stories that human beings told about themselves to explain the world, but at the end of the day, they didn't have any real utility. Power, economy and society don't need a justification because they work, and any change will be a step backwards. 
Or at least that's what this guy says. Look, I understand Fukuyama, but of course I don't justify him. It is pretty easy to take a stance from the middle class of a first world country and say, well, that's it, everybody stands still, nothing needs to change ever. But a lot of us really need things to change. We need a new horizon, real progress, hope, damn it. What else? Well, there is postmodernism that does not propose a big lot. It just breaks things. Oh, sorry, deconstruct. It complains and makes shitty, boring art. Just like you. Nah, this video is ain't art. What else? What else? What? That's it? There's nothing more? Are we out of ideas already? Ah, come on, the night is young. Well, it is said that in Chinese, crisis means the same as opportunity. And look, I don't speak Chinese, I barely speak English, but I have great news for my friends living on the margins of the empire. We, the third world countries, are in a privileged position, because we entered modernity when this crisis began. We experienced its beginning and its end on a single lifetime, so there is no better place for new ideas. I mean, come on, do you think the future is gonna come out of this flaming dumpster? Now let's start by sorting out the values of modernity to see what is working for us. What should stay and what should go? Let's see which were the progress. This one stays. History still owes me flying cars and beer porn. What? Who said that? Next. Human emancipation. Yeah, that one's cool. When did we forget about that one? I remember we made a declaration of human rights, but oh, I already see where the problem is. We understood those rights of the human as the rights of the individual. And little by little we came to see this individual as an isolated entity, concerned only by their possessions, their family and afraid of society. And I know, I know, Ayn Rand, you're gonna tell me that that's what makes you free, but dude, call on your libertarian tits, you're making things really uncomfortable out here. Society is no longer a place of collaboration between individuals, now it's a battleground for private interests. Yes, lady, you as an individual human being, you have rights, but guess what? Your rights are my responsibility. Lucky for you, my rights are your responsibility. We both make our part and we can have a decent life, but if we both break our contracts, then we create hell. So, human emancipation, that one stays. Not of the individual, human. A free society made out of free individuals moved by solidarity. It stays. Next. Freedom, this one stays, and look, we can even use it to strengthen our argument for solidarity. Because the freedom of the individual consists in being capable to realize itself, but no one can realize themselves in isolation, outside of society. No one is an island, therefore there can be no freedom without solidarity. This one stays, and if you don't agree, I would give my life for your right to say so. Next, the meaning of nature. Ah, uh, man, I don't know. This one's a no for me. What if we change the minion to collaboration? We need to take care of nature so she can take care of us. If we use her properties to feed ourselves and fight diseases, I don't think that she would mind. We're just part of the cycle. But if we burn down the Amazon, the lungs of our planet, just to plant soy to feed hundreds of thousands of living cows that we will slaughter to make shitty $1 burgers that our obese society don't need, then maybe we have earned all the bad things that befall us. So let's change the minion for collaboration and then we say yes! Next! Finally, rationality. Freaking yes, dude! Without reason we have nothing, there is no future, just blind tribalism and endless violence. But we also need to add spirituality, as a counterweight to pure logic. I know, I know, it sounds weird, sounds wishy-washy. I'm not telling you to believe in some god or to stick some crystals up your pussy. I'm just asking you to look at the sky, to our place in this infinite universe full of miracles and mysteries. Let us contemplate the fragility of this blue marble that contains us and the absolute cosmic loneliness that surrounds us. In the face of the existential void, we could remember that we are the only guardians of the short but infinitely precious gift of life. The vanguard of complexity in a cosmos governed by entropy sons of bitches made of the same eternal substance of the universe that gave us senses and reason to contemplate itself. Carl Sagan said it already, we are made of star stuff. Yeah, but also Hitler and the straws we throw to the ocean, so respect the goddamn cosmos. Look, I am not complaining about Renaissance, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello and 
I don't know, Splinter, all the artists and thinkers of this epoch were some really wise mofos, but they couldn't see the future. Leonardo da Vinci said the experiment is the translator between human and reality. We already experimented with their ideas, we had some successes and many, many mistakes. But aren't we in a situation very similar to theirs? We started by reviewing the values that tie us to the epoch that shaped us. Now let's build the ones that will replace it. Let's move forward to a second renaissance. The challenge is to stop running blindly towards extinction and build a new global society, unified at the top and infinitely diverse at the bottom, where each individual has the right to its personal identity, but also to develop true community, where every society and group can integrate into the whole humanity without sacrificing its differences. We need to keep an eye open for the new trends. There are signs that point to a new way of thinking. The new shape of the world can be read between the lines of the present situation. But a fundamental element is also missing. Imagination. Let's imagine. There has never been a better time for imagination. Also, no se te olvide por no ver.